What's the difference between Adolf Hitler and Abraham Lincoln? I want you to think about that for a second. I, I know one was awful and one turned out to be a really good leader, but really, what's the difference between some of the worst leaders in the world and some of the best leaders in the world? Is it the purpose? Is it what they wanted to accomplish in the world? Is it their method? Is it how they went about doing it? Or is it the end state? Is it what was eventually accomplished in their lives? and in their leadership. Today on Ed Talks Live, we're gonna roll up our sleeves and talk about what makes leaders great. But we're also going to make application for you right now in your career, in your life, and in your business. So by the time we're done, you're gonna know how to lead better so that you can move people to action in the right direction and change the world. Welcome, this is Ed Talks Live, and today we're talking about leadership. Hey there, welcome to the show. My name is Ed Rush, five-time number one best-selling author and former F-18 fighter pilot and your host for the most positive place on the planet for insanely implementable ideas. We're in the middle of a week talking about how you can flat out change the world. And we're creating a movement, which is what I said, look, it's one way or another. Either the world is going to get worse and then finally we're gonna be in charge or the world is gonna get better and then finally, we're going to be in charge. But either way, I believe that entrepreneurs, smart, innovative business owners are like you are going to take over the world and leadership is a part of it. So if you just joined us, this show, Ed Talks Live, we air every weekday, Monday through Friday at 10 o'clock Pacific, one o'clock Eastern. If you've joined us on YouTube, the chat button is over there to the right. Please jump in, tell us who you are, where you're from and what you do. If you're on Facebook, that's right below you, Twitter, is the same, and if you happen to be watching this on video, say hello in the comments uh, section. Tell me what your biggest lesson learned uh, was from uh, your time with us today. Uh, and also, you can look at the timestamps below and see the chapters of what we're covering and each of the topics as they go. Today, uh, we are talking about how to train leaders who change the world, and my guest, Scott Zimmerman, is no stranger to great leadership, in fact, He's out there on the front lines training some of the biggest leaders in the Fortune 500 world right now. But before I do that, I want to say hello, as usual, to my friends in chat. Dennis Bauer, second day in a row, he's first in chat. Today, I started reading Warrior <laughs> while drinking Rock Creek coffee, baby. I love it. From Costa Rica. <laughs> Thanks to you. Life is good. Rock Creek, by the way, uh, my clients, Joel and Margaret Gargaro, who make some of the best coffee in the world. If you haven't had a chance to order from them. Go get it. You'll be supporting a small business and not St. Arbucks. All right. Uh, Denise says, good morning from Vancouver. What's up, Wendell Bugs? J uh, jumped in early as well. Oz from Iron Core Way. Man, I got those kettlebells working, baby. Still three days a week. I did it yesterday. I was passed out, man. I, I think I did something wrong. Uh, let me uh, say to Dr. Edwin Berry, a little raining, he said in Montana. Uh, hello, Barry. Good to see you. Delisa Tool as well. Robert, welcome to the show. Prime the pump. That was from our show yesterday, man. I love it. David Zett's taking notes. Uh, from yesterday. <laughs> Dr. Edwin, yes, very fundamental. Sally, welcome to the show. Aubrey, welcome back. M. Johnson, welcome to the show. Matt Head as well. Uh, glad to see you, John Teague and Rafael. Thank you for your awesome comments. There you are. Thank you for your awesome comments over on Instagram. By the way, if you haven't been following me on Instagram, some of the best tips and strategies and show clips are there. At Ed Rush Pilot is my follow handle over on Instagram. Richard's got his hydro brew. Man, we're, we're cranking. I love it. Hello, Salik. Welcome. Uh, and uh, same thing, drinking the coffee. Uh, and there's, by the way, the link uh, to my, my friends up north. I don't get a penny from that. I just want you to support an amazing small business. All right. So if you just joined us, this is how to train leaders who change the world. In a moment, I'm going to be introducing my friend, Scott Zimmerman. But you know, we haven't talked a lot about leadership as a topic on this show. We've talked quite a bit about how you lead, but you know, how you lead is central to almost everything that happens in your life and your business from building great teams to getting them all going in the right direction. And my guest today, my friend Scott Zimmerman is no stranger to great leadership. Scott's leadership capabilities and business acumen were honed at a small little company 
called General Electric, one of Fortune, uh, Fortune's most admired companies. Beginning early on as a salesperson, Scott was promoted, check this out, six times in nine years to the top 1% of his country, uh, company. He recently left General Electric and he, uh, he, Electric, and he is uh, one of the leading consultants in the world, helping leaders who are on the front line catalyze their audience and change the world. Scott lives in Tampa with his wife and his three children and his golden retriever. Uh, Scott's also a golf friend of mine. Uh, we've known each other uh, now for about six months and talk almost every other week on the phone about our businesses. Scott, my first question for you is, as I was preparing for today's show, I was wondering, how did it feel growing up when you were always the last person in line at school when they lined up by alphabetical order? That was literally my first question. It was consistent. <laughs> I, I was R. I think only one time did we switch it around. The Z's went first. I was R. I always was jealous of the Aaron's and the Bakers and the Abels. But anyway, we're we're in the leadership. More time leadership. at recess. More time at recess. <laughs> What's that? More time at recess. More t- hey, th- there's always there's the cups always half full. Um, all right, so take me back, dude, into your story. I mean, your leadership story is awesome. We're going to talk about leadership strategies. But take me back. To, to the honing of the Scott uh, Zimmerman leadership understanding. Yeah, I mean, I for me, uh, you know, I started like a lot of people inside of uh, corporate America coming out of college. And um, my first roles were really in sales. Uh, I worked for another one of America's most admired companies, Merck, you know, kind of coming out of school. And, um, you know, wasn't really intellectually satisfied with, um, you know, the pharmaceutical trade. And so got more interested in getting into the surgical and interventional space. So I spent the first eight or nine years of my career on the front line, really selling, but probably selling in a different way than a lot of folks do. I was very oriented, not on how can I move my product and hit my quota, but how can I make a real um, contribution for customers? And when I got to 30 years of age or so, I was kind of recognizing, hey, I just I don't have the uh, light in me to be doing this another 10 years. Like what really turns me on? And when I thought about what really turned me on, it was helping surgeons out of difficult positions in surgeries. It was helping salespeople achieve more with less waste, you know, with less uh, effort. And I, I said to myself, hey, you know, maybe one of the best places that I could make a difference would be leading companies. What's the best place I could go to learn to lead companies? And at the time, Forbes came out with an article comparing seven uh, former GE uh, executives who went on to become CEOs to Harvard MBAs that went to Bain and became CEOs. And the result was there's no statistical difference in their performance. You'd be better off going to GE. And so that's really what I set out to do. I was in a sales role, um, you know, exceeded plan and was able to get into a, but GE is such a great company in that they take big risks on you. So I really had an opportunity to work in a lot of different domains outside of sales on the path to eventually operating a global business. So take us to, hang on real quick. I'm going to get rid of that little uh, name underneath you. Take us to the first part of our discussion. So when you and I were on the phone talking about the idea of our the way that our country leads, in fact, if I remember correctly, our first conversation we had on the phone about six months ago, uh, we spent about 30 minutes talking about our what what we were calling our national dilemma in terms of leadership. I would now say that's an international dilemma as far as leadership. I think across the board, our leaders have failed us. And by the way, if you're, uh, as you're watching, I'm not even, this isn't even a partisan statement. I'm not talking about one person. I'm talking about the system. Uh, And so what is the dilemma? I mean, we'll talk about some of the solutions, but what's the dilemma that we're facing in the world as you see it on the leadership scale? Well, I think you're right. I mean, I think it doesn't matter if we're looking at leadership kind of globally or we're looking at it more locally inside of an organization. Most organizations aren't failing for technical reasons. Uh, They're failing for relational and developmental ones. And, you know, that's where this kind of notion of training comes in. So I think the real challenge the world's facing is that we've got a lot of new exponential technology that's accelerating things. It's making more information available to us, but we're not seeing exponentially improved choices from our leaders. And I think, you know, two big things that are at the the forefront of that, you know, number one, um, this increased access to information is a little bit of a problem because it overwhelms us. There's almost too much information that we're consuming. It leaves us pretty scattered. 
um, and not centered. But I think the access to information also allows other actors to really promote disinformation. So it's getting much harder to make sense of what rational truth is. And I think a lot of leaders don't recognize that they're op operating in a simulated version of reality. <clears throat> they don't recognize the difference between their opinions about what's happening and the actual facts um, in their organization. And I would argue that everyone can have their own opinions, but if we're really to advance an organization or to advance as a society, we can't have our own facts. And so what we see is that leaders are, you know, their decisions are, they're kind of jumping to their decisions out of intuition. Um, instead of having really good sense making, they're a little bit overconfident um, and they're kind of optimizing sometimes for themselves or the self-interest of smaller groups versus, you know, thinking about uh, larger groups and their decisions. And I think that has a big impact um, and can do meaningful damage because when people are thinking about optimizing what's best for themselves, they aren't tending to the ramifications of their decision. They're making that decision locally in the moment and then kind of missing the opportunity for its impact on others. It's interesting. So you, I want to get to a conversation that we had a few months ago, but what you just said, I think is so important. And I want to just anchor on that for a moment. You talked about leaders and their opinions. And I spent some time yesterday, yesterday and the day before, and, and, and actually, I started to get a little sad about this. And I, I'll tell you, there's a positive end to this thinking. But I thought, you know, as a country, sadly, potentially a large majority of our country would prefer, and, and I mean this when I say this, would prefer uh, that their viewpoint would be supported instead of the truth. In other words, if you were to hand someone something that was 100% true, and they knew it was 100% true, but it, it countered their view of the world, they wouldn't want that. And I thought, how did we get here as a nation where truth is now second in importance to what my tribe to chooses to believe on any given day? Totally, well, I mean, you know, I mean, from a developmental perspective, that's a developmental challenge. Um, and I like to think about it um, as kind of levels of consciousness. There are these different levels of consciousness that are operating. and. When we're in the base of you know Maslow's hierarchy, which I think a lot of people are familiar with, we're thinking about our own safety and security, right? And obviously, there's a lot of concern um, with leaders and individuals right now at the you know at the base of Maslow's hierarchy. We have the the notion of belonging to groups. We have the notion of our ideas mattering. So we tend to be attracted um, to making sure that our own needs are taken care of first. That's called an egocentric consciousness. Um, an ethnocentric consciousness is when we begin to have affinity for another group. It's an organization we work for. It might be our political leanings left or right. And really beginning to identify and have a divided us versus them mentality. And so this really leads us into a bias. The first bias you were talking about is a confirmation bias. This is where we have an opinion about something. And then we look for evidence that supports our opinion and ignores all the counter evidence to our opinion. What we're talking about here is, you know, something different. This is really about the diversity that we have in terms of our relationship to the world. And what we need to get out of this is we need leaders starting in organizations, starting with individuals who see beyond differences that, that value the diversity of ideas, genders and races because when we do that, we're outwardly seeking other people's perspectives to inform us. We're more of an open system. You know, we sometimes talk about people who have a closed head, uh, meaning they have very rigid thoughts and they're not very open to other inputs. They have a closed heart. You know, they spend a lot of time living in judgment of other people um, and they have a closed hand. They keep doing things the same way they've always done them. Someone with an open head is receptive and interested in what other people's opinions are. And they're, they're really seeking the truth. Instead of living in judgment of other people, they seek to understand and to operate from a deep care for others' concerns. And then people with an open hand have the courage uh, to try new things. And so, you know, inside of organizations, inside of leaders, and we have to lead ourselves too, uh, there's a real benefit in moving from closed to open. It's interesting. And I'm going to get, we're going to go a little deeper on the subject of bias. I think what you just said there is fascinating when you started talking about 
confirmation bias. We're going to do that. Before I do that, I just want to welcome you. If you just joined us, by the way, we had a whole bunch of folks just join us on the live show. Uh, this is Ed Talks Live, the most positive place on the planet for insanely implementable ideas. Uh, our show today is How to Train Leaders Who Change the World. I'm here with my friend, Scott Zimmerman. We're talking about leadership, both in your company, but also in the world. Uh, my goal, by the way, is to raise 400 leaders who will go into the world at a national level uh, and change the way we lead as a nation. More on that in just a second. But before I do that, I want to catch up on some of the comments in chat. Uh, thank you very much, by the way, for saying hello. Hello, Nobby. Good to see you, buddy. Karen, uh, who said she's been watching the last week, but saying hi from Rochester, Washington. Overcast, but a great start. John, who's coming in from uh, 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 London, actually, or England, uh, UK, actually. Diana, hello. Leaders, she says, bring laughter, wonderful, uh, wonder, gratitude to their team. David Zed says, if you're not first, you're last, or you're the first of the last. Uh, and Mike Semmel from Las Vegas, on his way to New York, uh, one of my friends and clients says, Senator da Daniel Patrick Moynihan said, everyone is entitled to his own opinion, but not to his own facts, uh, but not his own facts. I actually really like that. Thank you, Mike. Um, Mike has got a, a, a thousand pound brain um, and is, is fun to work with as well. So let's get into this discussion of bias. By the way, if you just joined us, my name is Ed Rush. I'm here with my friend, Scott Zimmerman. We're in a show called How to Train Leaders who train, uh, change the world. And Scott, you, we had a phone call about four months ago and I said, I said something and you said something back and it blew my mind. And I'm going to, I'm going to do this reader's digest version, but then I'm going to ask you about this bias that you said there were two types of bias. So one of my principles as a, as, as a leader, so I look at the world. Uh, if you're interested in more on this discussion, by the way, Ed Rush for America is the website. When I looked at the world and our leadership, what I realized is our political leaders base their decisions on four criteria. The four criteria are uh, what will get them money, what will get them reelected, what will get their friends money, and what will get their friends reelected. Those are the four, Either, both sides, by the way. And so when I started trying to pull leaders together, I was trying to find a new way of looking at the promises through which you make decisions. And so together, my, my group and I created a, what we call our four promises. And the four promises are you'll never violate your conscience or do something that you believe is morally wrong. That's number one. The second one is I'll do what's best for my country. The third one is I'll do what's best for my state or district. And the fourth one is I'll do what's best for the world. Uh, and when I was talking through those with you, it was interesting because the first question you asked is, well, why can't you just do all four at the same time? And I was like, bam, that's, that's what I'm talking about. And that day, Scott, I changed the website and it says right on the website, these are not in order, these are collective. In other words, these are the overall objectives, not, not in a hierarchical, hierarchical order. So what you did was help me see through some bias on a way that I was thinking through something that things had to be judged linearly, not uh, in terms of a whole sequentially. So talk to me about the bias that you see in the workplace, in the corporate world, in the leadership world, in, in, our, in our country, and also across the world and the two types of bias that you see and how they affect leaders. Yeah, I mean, I, I think there, you, there, are, there are more than two types of bias, but when I think about what's happening in the political sphere, <clears throat> you know, we see the choices that in retrospect, um, you'll wish we have done differently around the coronavirus. Um, you know, these two are kind of front and center, right? So we're talking, you know, primarily about confirmation bias. Um, and th then we're talking about kind of a diversity bias, meaning we're more interested in people's viewpoints who look more like our own. So even as you think about your four, um, you know, principles that you were talking about, the reality is those first three principles are very much oriented in paying attention to what's good for myself. And that's super awesome. Like when you're trying to achieve something, um, you have a drive to achieve something in the world and business, or you want to run a marathon. Like it's awesome that you have that egocentric orientation, but it ignores others. Um, when you have an ethnocentric orientation, you're more loyal to the group you're in. And we're in all kinds of groups. Like, you know, my closest relationship in life is my wife, Jana, right? And the groups keep getting bigger. If you're a leader, it's your team is the group that you're, or the team you're on are probably the groups that you're more loyal to than to the employees who might be extended to you. And there's really, um, that can, be, there can be a healthy relationship there, but it can cut the other way. And when we start to put the group ahead of others, 
um, and we start to get into us versus them biases, that becomes an issue uh, for us. And so when I was talking to you about the container and how we think about it in the business, leaders need to become more with more information access and more disinformation out there. We have to watch our susceptibility to becoming intellectually lazy and falling back into thinking patterns that we've had about what has worked in the past, because those are the patterns that will keep us in the past. And instead, for really important decisions, we have to be putting these biases up for view to make sure that they're not operating on us. So when I think about your four principles, I like to think about things like they're a system. Like I think systems thinking is really important in businesses today. And so the, the smallest circle in a system is you as an individual, right? Or what's the impact on your team? You know, and so let's do it with coronavirus. So coronavirus is the choices of individuals. Right. What, what, what's happening? How is the virus affecting individuals at, you know, in the world level? And how does it compare to other things that we know about? Like it's not the flu. You know, if we know the truth, then we know it's a little bit. It's not the flu, really. So it's a respiratory condition. That's what they share in common. But there are five factors about it that are very different um, than the flu. And it has an implication. What implication does it have? It has an implication on the healthcare system. Is the healthcare system built with enough capacity to handle a novel virus, something different than the flu that it's used to? Is it staffed appropriately? Do we have the supplies, et cetera? If the healthcare system is overrun, there's a next larger circle of society. What does this mean for essential workers, right? So we, we can keep expanding this out. The next circle would be what's the economic impact of not getting the smaller individual circle right? And then there's a, you know, kind of a global uh, impact in terms of like, where does our country stand in the world? And so it's really important around big decisions for leaders to get out of thinking about what's good for them and their individual team and start to understand the ramifications of a decision now on all these other groups. How does it expand or limit my choices? And most leaders are really caught in a win. They, they think from a win-lose perspective because they're operating from the bottom of Maslow's hierarchy. They're thinking about themselves or the group they identify with. But the real value is in pushing our thinking to find win-win solutions or another way of saying that is omni-considerate choices. These are choices where everyone wins, where everybody's perspective has been taken into account. It's really good. I mean, you think about that. Just take this pandemic as an example. So... We have decisions being made in Washington, which are filtered essentially through, and this is over, overly simplistic, which are filtered through, okay, how's this going to affect my political career? How is this going to affect my party? And then how's it going to affect my state? So for example, somebody who's from New York primarily is considered what's happening with this virus in New York. Someone from California is considering the, their area in California, which is important. I'm not denying that, but at the same time, wouldn't it be amazing for a leader to think, how will this help everyone in the country? But better than that, how will this help the people in Italy? You know, how, how will this help folks in Sweden? How will this help us as, an, as a world actually move forward together? And then, interestingly, it takes you into time too, right? What, what decision now is the best decision not for 2020, but what's the best decision for 2040? What's going to set us up as a world to be in a great place 20 years from now. And you don't hear a lot of that, do you? No, and I, I mean, I love what you're doing, right? You're, you're, you're asking questions that kind of stretch your perspective. And that's really what we need is we kind of need to hold our perspective. If we want to have more innovation in the world, we want to have leaders who don't over-operate or uh, their companies into decline, then we have to be generating more possibilities. Like that's one of the skills people, you know, leaders should be focused on is how are they getting more creative and generating more uh, perspectives. And, and one of the ways they can do that is be asking others what they see, because we all have a different life experience that informs kind of what we're taking in. And what I love the most is when you get a team or an organization that begins to have an interest in, in taking in all the perspectives so we can choose the wisest one to operate from. And I think you're pointing at something else that's really important right now as well. I mean, I think more than any other event, you know, in recent time, the world is recognizing that we're more interconnected than we've ever been. We're, you know, geopolitically, we're more dependent on each other than we've ever been. Um, and so all countries, instead of seeing our relationship as rivalrous, we benefit from actually seeing 
and pursuing omni considerate choices in relationship with each other. I love uh, I love reading science fiction, and one of the things I love about so, uh, for example, um, Orson Scott Card has written this Ender's Game series, which I read every book in the series. About sixteen books, by the way. My sons just started reading Ender's Game. If you've ever read that book, well, the summary of Ender's Game is the world gets attacked by aliens, much like every science fiction book. Uh, they start at China, so China just gets wiped out completely. And the entire world basically goes to help China. And I thought, how cool is that? Like, not cool that China gets wiped out, but how cool is it that the world finally decides to get together when we have a common enemy? Well, the fact is, we now have a common enemy. <laughs> I mean, it's like we're all facing the same thing. And it is now a great time for all of us to get together and to create solutions. And, and by the way, we've done some of that. I mean, you have the opportunity now to paste, copy and paste the the 30,000 digit code that represents a virus onto a website so that self-proclaimed scientists around the world can work on this solution and find, uh, or work on this problem and find solutions. So it's, it's fascinating. Yeah. Um, so I mean, but, but they're faster, right? I mean, if we ever had a situation in which a virus, you know, could travel like this, right? The amount of air travel we have, the dependency our economies have on each other, you know, that's why the ethical conversation that we discussed up front and part of these biases in there, the ethical discussion is so, so important. You know, what is our responsibility, not only to ourselves, but to others um, to be really transparent about what's going on, the transparency you're talking about with this code so that we can co-create right solutions and insights from around the world. I mean, these are real opportunities. So when we look at the planet's biggest problems, and this is where I point back to, we have the technical expertise, right? It doesn't matter what domain we're talking about. The technical expertise exists around the world. It's, do we know how to work effectively together, you know, in service to a better plan? And that's why that third level of consciousness that I'm talking about is called world centric uh, consciousness, right? And so I get really excited about how do we actually support leaders for intentionally um, increasing their consciousness and just questions like you're asking start to get people thinking differently and opening up to new possibilities. Yeah, I mean, this is a fascinating topic. I mean, you think about the way, just look at the way we are as a country systemically. So, for example, every two years, every member of the House of Representatives gets reelected or or run, runs again for reelection. Every single member, every two years, every six years, Senate, every four years, obviously, the president. What that has created in our country is we have about a year and a half view on the decisions that we make, okay? What that means as a nation is we look about three to 500 days into the future, and that's it. Meanwhile, there are countries, for example, like China, who in 1945 created a 100-year plan to world domination. 100-year plan. Look, Scott, I would love to see us as a country have a 20-year plan. 100, yeah. 100, like a 20 year plan. Like, what would it be like if we as leaders made decisions that were great for a newborn right now when she turns 20? I mean, think about that for a second. That would be, that would be amazing. Any, any thoughts on that? I'm going to jump into chat for a second, but, but what are your no, thoughts? Just, I mean, just the, um, how interesting, you know, that orientation is, right? World domination. <laughs> it's just really kind of it's not thought out and it really represents this lower part of ourselves that's yeah. really interested in rivalry and this notion that in order for me to win you have to lose like that's right and in a competition that kind of matters but when we're really talking about the issues we face from a political perspective i mean how much time are people spending in the room understanding their respective you know positions and how much are we really focused on the outcome we're trying to solve versus look good to the constituents, you know, who voted for us? I, at the end of the yeah. day, the constituents probably want the outcomes, you know, that we're interested in solving. And so, you know, it's really important, even in organizations, really the first step and the biggest thing I see missing, I walk into an organization and often it's just three questions. You know, it's what's possible, it's what's present, and it's what's missing. Mm. And uh, often what's missing um, is a lot of clarity and alignment, even at the most senior levels, about what the unique value is that we can bring into the market. That's good. Man. Hey, if you're a writer downer and you should be, what's possible, what's present, what's missing. If you work with companies, 
walk in and ask those three questions. I love that, man. Um, hang on real quick. We're going to just um, jump in the chat. I, I have to catch up and say hello to some of you who have been saying hello. If you just joined us, by the way, my name is Ed Rush, former F-18 fighter pilot. I'm here with my bud, Scott Zimmerman. We're talking about how to train leaders who change the world in about 30 seconds. Scott, I'm going to come to you. We're going to start talking about how to develop skills inside of the leaders uh, that we're working with. Uh, but I love some of the comments. Fail fast forward. You can't learn anything. You can you can learn and accomplish nothing if you wait until you're ready. I like that. Mike uh, Semmel says, yep, you can't wait for all the information. General Colin Pell made a decision when you have 40 to 70% of the information. If you wait for all the information, you will be too late. One of my favorite quotes from President Obama, uh, he said, he said, as a president, I had no easy decisions. Everything that came to me was a hard decision because if it was easy, uh, it would have been decided before it came to me. And he said, so we used to have to make decisions that were 40% that had a 40% chance of success and and tell everyone that it was going to work. <laughs> I thought it was amazing the way that he said that. It was really smart. Uh, Dr. Barry says, in terms of physics, Scott and Ed are discussing how to make decisions that best keep the entropy of the system low, which benefits everyone. I like that. That's uh, right. Win, win versus win-lose. I like it. Very good comments. Thank you for that. Gina says, um, love what you're saying. And then Karen says, sometimes the best decision is to hold and get more information. Knee-jerk reactions cause greater uh, problems often than it fixes. Uh, David says, went into the stuff in depth with my mom last night. We determined that the millennials got this one. <laughs> and by the way, uh, Scott's website is right below him. Uh, you can go to scottwzimmerman.com or adaptiveedge.com. Those are his two websites. They go to the same place. Uh, if you're not connected to Scott on social, I highly recommend that. I also recommend that you read what he writes. He's one of the best writers on this topic and if you want beach fluff trash scott's not your guy if you want deep <laughs> discussions of leadership he's the guy to talk to okay if you want golf swing advice he may be able to help you with that too all right so uh if you just joined us by the way uh, my name is ed rush this is how to train leaders who change the world i'm here with my friend scott zimmerman and let's talk about developing skills. So one of the things that I love doing is finding and identifying young leaders with a heart and a passion for change uh, and working with them to see them grow into greater leaders in their area uh, and then helping them grow into world leaders in the way they communicate and the way they lead. What do you think are the keys in terms of developing skills in, in young and old leaders? Yeah, I mean, I think um, I think there are four, you know, real barriers to kind of developing the skill in the current environment. I mean, the first one is is short termism is you know rampant um, in organizational communities today, and it typically shows up when the initiatives of the day are all about us doing something faster. You know, we seem to be preoccupied with short term results, magic bullets, and clever techniques that we hope will miraculously work. But the reality is real changes skill uh, require a foundation. You know, we have to kind of work on them over a period of time. I think the second thing um, that we see in young people who are earnest and we want to develop, but also in organizations when we think about initiatives is the more problem. Again, I, anytime you know, your initiatives are about more and faster, um, we're really not paying attention to the skills we need to develop in order to be able to create those results. So there are a lot of people out there that are really hungry to learn and grow, and they're investing in courses and reading a ton of books. But the problem is if, if courses and books are too information heavy, it actually promotes us doing the opposite of what it takes to build skill. I think the third thing is there's so much coming at us that a lot of people's motivation is really compromised. You know, they, they wanna jump from this to that. But I think in order to develop the most essential skills, people have to have conviction. They have to have a passion and single mindedness around being successful in a very small number of crucial areas. They can't just be jumping around. And then I think from a strategy perspective, um, skill performance requires practice. It requires converting knowledge into skills. And what I see a lot is when we try to get somebody to work with, let's say, a new relationship technique that will help them out it's going to be awkward. It's going to be uncomfortable, but the relational and trust issues inside this business aren't going to get better if you don't have the courage to kind of step into this space. And so, you know, what I'm really focused in on when we pick a set of skills, like I get excited about how important attention is today. It's basically a foundational practice and we can get into that a little bit more. 
we have to get better at relationships. Like building trust is actually a skill. It has components and you need to work on those respective components. We need to have, we need to get better at thinking practices as leaders because in the end, our decisions have implications for the people that we lead and the customers we serve. And then we also need to think about uh, what I would call agency practices. And what I mean by that is you think about a sports agent, right? A sports agent's out there advocating for these players that'll be drafted in the NFL draft. Agency is about your ability to enact what you're trying to drive, whether you need to enact it individually or through a team or you know group of teams inside of an organization. Yeah, I mean, it, it reminds me of flight training. You know, we had we had a syllabus that we went through to learn how to fly. That syllabus allowed for some creative creativity inside of it, but not a lot. I mean, initially we were learning how to do it well, and then eventually, as we went on to be pilots and instructors, we were on the cutting edge of creating great innovation. It was kind of that Navy Marine Corps leadership thing that really kind of got us going. Super interesting. Um, well, I think it's interesting. You know, I love the pilot thing, right? I mean, you and I were talking kind of pre-show on this. And, you know, I mean, how many people out there would trust a pilot who had read a bunch of books and gone to a seminar but hadn't had actually logged any flight hours? How many are going to trust a surgeon who'd read a bunch of books, right, and attended seminars but, you know, actually hadn't practiced under the guidance of, you know, somebody better? So I think in the end, we're living in a very dynamic world. Those four areas I talked about are actually very sophisticated skills. I mean, they're static, you know, they're static skills that people have, like perform this mundane task. But when we think about sophisticated skills where you act and something happens, but you don't know what's going to be, that's a dynamic skill. And the only way you build skill for a dynamic environment like flying a jet, um, where you might become disoriented and you need to learn to trust your instruments, the only way you learn to trust those instruments is to have been pushed into scenarios and simulations that wanted you to trust your intuition when you needed to be trusting your flight instruments. Yeah. Um, and so I really look at this skill piece as saying you, you got to have a very small number of choices. It's the same with golf. You can't be working like on all aspects of the swing. We literally have to build up the processing pattern in the brain the way that it organizes the information until it becomes reflexive. And then we can move on to the next area. It's huge, man. And I want to go a little bit deeper on this skill thing. And there's a question actually in chat that I'm going to use to start this. You said something which got my attention and you said something about the word attention. I'm going to come back to that in a second because uh, it's something in leadership that I really haven't heard much and uh, I probably should have. So uh, I just want to uh, just take a break or take a pause real quick and just say, uh, we had just had several uh, people just join us. So welcome to the show. Uh, this is Ed Talks Live, the most positive place on the planet for insanely implementable ideas. My name is Ed Rush. I'm here with my friend Scott Zimmerman. We're talking about how to train leaders who will change the world, starting, by the way, uh, with you. So inside of chat, Scott, David Zetz uh, said, uh, as a leader, and by the way, we're going to stop and take your questions right here at the end of the show in about 10 minutes. So hang with us and put your questions into chat for Scott. I want to make sure you have a chance to get your specific questions answered. Uh, but David says, as a leader, what would you say are the three most important skills to master? Uh, what do you think? Yeah, you know, it's, it's very related to what I was um, you know, just riffing on a little bit there. I think, number one, the most important uh, practice today, it's foundational to getting better at all the other ones, is the ability to control your attention. You know, if we can't cultivate attention and concentration, um, we're going to be challenged to get better in the other practices. We're going to be challenged to stick with practice until we develop skills. So I think for people out there you know, who may notice, like you get a notification on your phone or you get a notification on your computer and then you cycle through all these other apps, um, you know, that's a symptom probably of a larger problem. And in order for us to get better, you know, we really have to be able to cultivate the ability to focus on one thing at once. And we'll we'll talk more about that because I think it's really important. I think the second thing that we're seeing inside of a, you know, an accelerated um, technological environment, right? Our, our markets, everything is moving faster than before. I think we, we've lost touch with how important personal connection is um, inside of our businesses. So your personal connection and caring for your team, uh, the caring for the larger organization, the caring for your customers. At the end of the day, trust building is the largest cultural fulcrum um, that you have as a leader. We don't have to muscle people. People don't come to work to suck on purpose. 
And so when you think somebody sucks, you know, it's time for you to step back and recognize, you know, what is your role in it? What we typically find is that leaders are not being transparent uh, when they're disappointed, you know, with somebody or something. Leaders are very much oriented around, I'm getting a different outcome than I expected. And they don't have the emotional sophistication to be able to deal with that. So relational practice for me would be number two. Leaders need to develop their minds. You know, we, I find leaders um, you know, uh, have a lot of confidence um, in how smart they are. And they've got great degrees and they are very smart. But the reality is they need to become skilled at surfacing more problem uh, possibilities to the problems they're encountering in their environment. You know, doing a better job kind of troubleshooting those and making better choices. So everybody thinks they're an expert in this area, but they're unaware of how their biases are disruptive. And then that fourth piece is agency. Like in order, there may be specific skills that you as a leader need to develop. So if I'm a leader um, and I've worked on these skills, like attention practice is about getting myself grounded. Relational practice is about overcoming my biases and caring about others. Thinking practice is about the right choice. Well, then I have to go out into the world and move things in order to make the world better. And so that may mean you've got to get better up on stage, you know, delivering your ideas clearly. So that might be an example of an agency practice. It's interesting. So first of all, I love the quote. Um, how does it go? You don't, somebody didn't come to work to suck on purpose. Is nobody that comes to work to suck on purpose. <laughs> I, would have, I have to, put, I'm going to have to put to post that to Instagram today with your name underneath of it, Scott. Um, isn't that, isn't that amazingly true though? I mean, I remember when I was in the Marine Corps and by the way, as you get higher up in the, in the leadership, in a certain, in, in the armed services, you would think that as you get higher, the leaders would get better. And here's what happened to the leadership as you got higher, as you got higher, the good leaders were great and the bad leaders were awful. It's like it diverged, you know? When you're at low levels of leadership, everybody kind of was okay. And then it just diverged. And the biggest difference, Scott, in my mind, between the great leaders, I'm talking about colonels and generals who people would die for, literally, uh, versus the ones that would, would in Vietnam get shot in the back kind of leaders. Um, the difference was you knew the good leaders really cared about you. Yeah. And you knew the bad leaders really cared about themselves. That was it. I mean, you just knew, isn't that true? Yeah, no, I mean, you know, just no trust, right? I mean, people can pick it up. You're giving signals off and the words that you say and, and how your words are different than the actions that you really take. So it goes back to what we talked about earlier with these biases. Um, if you're really operating from an egocentric conscious or an ethnocentric conscious, meaning you're more focused on yourself or the group you're in to the exclusion of others, this us versus them dynamic, yeah, then you're you're going to be less influential. People might do what you want. A term we used to use at GE, um, you know, with leaders that weren't as skilled was we called it malicious um, obedience, meaning you know people were obedient to that leader, but they they didn't really want to do what that person said, and that meant that their hearts and minds and souls weren't actually in it, which means we didn't get their best. You know, so when we think about this engagement crisis, or people really working on uh, work that's vital to them? Do they people? Do they think people at work and their leaders care about them and that they care about their ideas and their ideas matter? When we talk about things going wrong in the environment, breakdowns will happen, like we should expect them. And what I see most often is leaders falling into a pattern in private conversations of blame, um, which is really a downward cycle. You know, the notion that among the nine things that could have gone wrong, there are kind of categories of things, you know, and you can learn to see these categories. But amongst the categories of things that go wrong, you actually think they were being defiant. They were not following a process that was ascribed on purpose. You know, that might happen, but it's actually fairly rare. So we need to get more interested in what's wrong with the process or what's wrong in the environment. How does it not support the performer? I like to think of employees. I don't, I don't like to use that term. So I like, what does it take for the performer to be able to do their job with consistency? And I think orienting from that perspective is, you, know, you can't be intellectually lazy and blame somebody. You actually have to get interested. You have to get intellectually curious about what's going on here, which means you need to be in a conversation 
a transparent conversation with them about what's going on here. Yeah, I mean, if, if, there, if there's a ball that drops, I mean, I learned this again back in the Marine Corps. If there's a ball that drops, the first thing that you're trained to do as a Marine leader is look at how you influence the dropping of that ball. And I, I, for, I, for example, I had a guy that I used to work with as a consultant for years who, great mind, great entrepreneur, okay leader. And the balls would get dropped and he would come in and say, I told those idiots a thousand times. And I would go, you didn't tell them. <laughs> like, you didn't tell them once, you know, not even that, not a thousand. But in a, sometimes in, in a leader's mind, you think, gosh, I, I said it, you know. Well, yeah, you might have said it, but you might have said it in the middle of another 50 things that it just gets lost in the mix. So I learned in the Marine Corps, if you're going to tell someone to do something, you use four things, task, meth meth method, per task, method, purpose, end state. You tell someone what to do. You tell them how to do it. You tell them why they're doing it and when it's all said and done, uh, what to look like. So that's good stuff, man. I'm going to come back and just good. Good. Oh, yeah. I was just going to jump in a little bit on a question because I think one of yeah. my favorite uh, questions, because we see that we see this pattern so often in leaders, is to start with the question that what is it about me and my leadership that this is showing up? Yeah. You know, because we're, we're opening the door to looking at our role in it. And the beauty of that is we're, we don't become resigned on the person. It, it gets us out of judgment on the person and actually get us oriented around things we can actually do. So we feel a better sense of control. So it puts us, it's a, it's like a light switch. It puts us in an instantly more productive mindset to act and you know make a positive change. Big time, man. And the, interestingly, it reminds me of the idea of responsibility. So yeah, 20 years ago, a Navy carrier pulled out of San Diego Harbor. It was under tug at the time. Uh, they hadn't even left the Harbor and they ran right into a sandbar. And the captain that day got relieved of his command. People said, well, wait a second. He wasn't even driving the carrier at the time. Well, yeah, but he was the captain of a Navy carrier and, you know, Navy carriers don't hit sandbars. That's just the way it is because fundamentally as a leader, you're responsible for whatever happens in your organization. Now, when I talk to leaders about this, I always tell them your response, it might not be your fault, by the way, but it is your responsibility. And I think what you're describing is, is a sense of radical responsibility towards what's happening in your organization. It really does start with looking at, looking at the way that you do things. I liked... Uh, I liked Pete Buttigieg in the very first Democratic debate. The moderator went after him about a shooting that happened in South Bend. And the first thing he said, was, she said, why did that happen? And he, and he said, because I couldn't get it done. And I'm like, that's a leader answer right there. The dude was trained in the military. And I said, that's a leadership answer. I don't care what you think about his politics. That was a leadership answer. Anyway, what are your thoughts on that? No, I totally agree. I mean, I think uh, from a leadership perspective, you know, if you found working with a board or talking to somebody else, I mean, you don't throw somebody else, you know, under the bus. I mean, I see a lot of group think inside of board settings as well. Um, and so one of the things that we have to do as a leader is we have to kind of be shaping, you know, people's thinking. And I think anything we can do um, to take responsibility. And, I, and I, I like that word in a lot of ways that like I like the way you're using it. But I also think in order for organizations to be more adaptive, they need to be training their response ability, you know, so their agility, their adaptiveness. And um, so I think that word can be used a lot of ways. And so often, you know, when we see these breakdowns occurring, it's very interesting when the leader starts to answer that question, what is it about me and my leadership that this keeps happening? You know, why are they on the gerbil wheel of all these breakdowns happening? It, get back, it gets back, you had a four uh, letter acronym there for the request, but it gets back to the request. What's the real clarity of the request? Am I providing the context on why I need this done? You know, am I open to an open conversation about that too? Because people may have questions or guidance that says this isn't a good thing to do. Am I being really clear about what's critical to quality to get it done right? Because otherwise they'll come back and it won't be what we wanted, but we didn't really explain. Yeah. You know what we wanted. And so often when I'm observing, I don't you know, I rarely work with leaders kind of individually, CEOs individually. I work with CEOs in the team because we're trying to bring the collective whole up and we're trying to get that entropy as one of your audience members said, kind of out of the system. And the best way to do that is with everybody kind of being in training together. Um, but you see it all the time where a task is done. Nobody writes it down. 
No name was given. There was no date for when it was done. There was no checking to see if it could be completed by the date that was surfaced. Yeah. So um, a lot of things start at the request. Man, that is so good. I've got, there's a really great comment in chat I'm going to get to in just a second. And also, as you're watching, we're about to take your questions. So please, inside of chat right now, if you have any questions for Scott or me on leadership, we've got about eight minutes left. Uh, type in the word question and then your question. Uh, and we'll jump in and start answering your question. Catherine, I'm going to come to what you said in just a second because I absolutely love uh, this. Uh, Gina said, as a captain, I'm responsible for the conduct of the crew under my command, said Captain Kirk from Star Trek VI. Um, uh, Oz said, always provide purpose, direction, and motivation for your soldiers. That was the most powerful idea I took from non-commissioned officer school. Dennis says, trust your instruments, babies. Trust your instruments. Trust your instruments. <laughs> I was taught, I was taught. I suppose there are several analogies there. Oh my goodness, Scott! I, I've got—I don't—we don't have time to do this. I have got some fuel stories that I could tell you. Oh my! Um, Catherine says, in order for me to focus and be effective, I turn off all notifications and clear the space so that there's only that one project in front of me for the designated amount of time. Uh, Catherine, one of the things I've done in the past at my events is that every single person in the event turn their phone on, go to the settings section and literally turn off every single notification. Uh, all the notifications on my phone are off, which means even text messages don't make a noise. So little things like that make a huge, huge, huge uh, difference. Uh, Scott. Yeah, we're, writing, you know, uh, we're writing a book on elite leadership right now. And like one of the early things is about our propensity for distraction and all the asymmetries that are out there that are making us more surface level and distracted. But I mean, Catherine, you're already doing some great things. I find, though, that when I'm writing the chapters of those books, I literally, like the phone's actually in a different room. And <laughs> everything that could be a distraction is somewhere else because, you know, I'm cultivating the practice of being deeply in the moment, um, working on what I'm working on. Um, and it's really hard, you know, it's really hard. It's not like we arrive on that skill. It's something we have to continue to tend to. And the other thing I really like is sometimes a task is too big and we procrastinate and we keep putting it off. But if we really care about quality in our work, we need to kind of be eating it in bite-sized chunks. So one of the things I've been most excited about for my own personal productivity, setting that stuff aside, but using a Pomodoro timer and really working in sprints. I mean, really being a leader in a lot of ways, if we wanna be an elite performer, like elite athletes or anybody in the arts, uh, these people spend the vast majority of their time training for the time when they're, you know, the real thing, you know, the things that really influence their success matter for leaders, that's choices yeah. uh, and the enactment of choices. And so that prep time, I love to kind of be thinking about it like it's an interval. I'm on for 25 minutes. Now I'm off. I'm on for 25 minutes. Now I'm off and really building that uh, habit of having a pump like that. It's an awesome productivity tip. By the way, I've been releasing these things called weekly flight briefings. Uh, they're one email, one video, one podcast a week. And in it, I've got a challenge. And next week, I just decided my challenge is going to be the noti phone notification off. So thank you, Scott. Um, and Catherine, thank you for that as well. All right, we're going to jump into some questions. By the way, if you just joined us, hang on a second. Uh, this is How to Train Leaders Who Change the World. My name is Ed Rush. I'm here with my friend, Scott Zimmerman, on this live show, we broadcast every weekday, Monday through Friday, 10 o'clock in the morning, uh, Pacific time, one o'clock uh, uh, in the afternoon, Eastern time. This is the most positive place on the planet for insanely implementable ideas. And by the way, if something you heard today influenced you in even the smallest way, please click that little thumbs up button below, that little like button that tells YouTube and Facebook and Twitter that you're more interested in content like this and it spreads it out to the world. So let's change the world one leader at a time by helping this content go out there. And if you haven't subscribed to this YouTube channel, please hit that little subscribe button and that little bell next to the subscribe button. That way you know when we have our next show. All right, so I'm gonna jump into uh, some of the questions and I've got uh, one that we're gonna start with. And then uh, as we go, uh, if we have, you have any more questions, we have just a few minutes left of Scott's time. Uh, and I really appreciate you jumping on the show. By the way, right below Scott is his website, scottwzimmerman.com. Highest recommendation to go there and read what Scott writes. It's compelling information that will help you change the world. All right. So if you just join us, my name is Ed Rush, how to train leaders to change the world with my friend, Scott Zimmerman. Scott, the first question that came in was from Mike Toy 
And Mike says, who do you think is history's greatest leader? I would just expand that to say, who do you think are some of the greatest leaders that you've seen in the world's history? And maybe why? Oh my gosh. I don't, you know, I, am I, even, I don't even know if I'm qualified to answer that question, but you know, <laughs> I think the, the one that you said earlier, when we talk about, you know, strong ethical foundation, um, really the openness to bring others points of view in to inform his own point of view, right? His ability to kind of work through that, to have led the country through one of its most difficult and divisive times would be Abraham Lincoln. Yeah. yeah. I would agree with you. I read just about every book that I could get a hold of on uh, someone like Abraham Lincoln. And then of course, Mike, you've got all of the people behind the scenes that you never even hear about who, who start and catalyze movements, uh, both for good and for bad. And so, you know, you have people who um, set the foundation in a lot of ways. So for example, Abraham Lincoln built on a foundation that was built by people like Frederick Douglass uh, and um, Harriet Tubman before that really kind of helped put him in the place where, where he wanted to be. Interestingly, when you talk about Lincoln, you know, the Republican Party didn't even exist until until Abraham Lincoln, just before Abraham Lincoln was elected president, there were two parties in the United States. There were the Democrats and the Whigs, and the Whigs actually went completely out within a 10-year period of time because they weren't willing to stand up to slavery. It's an interesting and fascinating study of the American two-party system. The only reason I tell you that is because the two-party system we have now, I think, is destined for failure, just like it was back in the 50s, all right? So um, let me see. Hold on a second. I want to make sure. Someone asked a question about your website. Is that website accurate? Two M oh, you know what? It's one N. <laughs> Sorry, man. I spelled, just go to adaptiveedge.com. How about that? Adaptive edges. Adaptive edges. I'll, 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 yeah. I'll we'll throw that into chat, Delisa. Uh, <laughs> thank you for going to the website, by the way. Adaptive edge is. Thanks for Mike. Mike's, Mike's got strong attention to detail. That's a well developed skill. I appreciate that. All right. So let's go to uh, one other question that we've got from Barry. Uh, Barry says, with such a sheep herd mentality in this country, how do we get past the power mongers and elect leaders with compassion, empathy, I love this question, dude, and positive leadership skills? What do you think, Scott? Man, how, how do we do that, right? <laughs> I think, I mean, that's, um, I think that's really, you know, really hard. So I don't know that I have a great, you guys are asking me these big, uh, <laughs> but I think, I think that's a big part of what we need. We've got to get back to uh, leaders who have a deeper purpose you know, that really have the, you know, Ed, to your, you know, the pieces you talk about, like they have to have an interest that's bigger than party. They have to have an interest that's bigger than themselves. They have to be kind of compelled to serve. And we have to have voters who can escape their rigid point of view to say, I need to put people in whose character um, and who I believe are credible in trying to actually, you know, advance the country. And I think that's a little bit of the pattern that we're in when we're so polar and when everything we have going, particularly from like a cable news media, if we go back to like Karen's earlier comment about data and we think about this coronavirus piece, you would have to do about an hour of research to say what is objective truth, you know, to kind of make this decision. And so like how many people are really going to go do that? So that's the thing I worry about the most is the, the repetition and the reinforcing pattern and the promotion of false information. Um, doesn't really support us for making the wisest choices for our leaders. So I think, you know, we say, hey, how are we going to get those right people in? In some way, we have to uh, get more truth into the electorate so they can make better decisions on that. Yeah, no joke about that. And I've got, obviously, some thoughts, Barry, on that. I mean, one of the things is, you know, we... So I was at an, uh, an event, um, thousands of people. It was a big political event. Uh, some of the biggest movers and shakers in the world. And somebody stood up and said, you know what we need? We need to make sure that when people get into political office, they already have money. That way they won't get corrupted when they get there. And I'm like, so the assumption, I guess, is that if they don't have money, they're going to be corrupted. But if they do, they're not going to be corrupted in some way. And it comes down a lot of ways to the person, you know, to the ethic of, of the person, to their view of the world, their morality and finding people like that. And the truth is, some of the best people in the world with the best hearts and the best brains are afraid of going into the political world because the consequences of losing are dire. You could lose your name, your reputation, your company, and you could potentially lose your life. I mean, we, there's people in Washington that play for keeps. And so we also need to elect people who are brave enough 
to look people in the eye and tell you this is the way that it's going to be. And I, I, I just tell you, Scott, I agree with you about the media cycle. I think as a country, we need to be willing to want to know what's true, no matter what the consequences are, uh, and look in, in a long-term way um, at the future. So I like I think it. We're pointing at something really important too, which is we have to kind of, you know, the leaders we need have to have a sense of sovereignty for themselves to kind of know the forces that are operating on them to have their own strong internal compass um, for what they're trying to accomplish, that they, you know, that they have a purpose that's beyond themselves is a clue. Yeah. Is that just words, or do you actually see them come alive when they talk about? Is it theatrics on the stage, or is it really in them yep. um, when you see them interact, even in small group settings? Forty-year view, Yanabi says, Ed for president. <laughs> All right, cool. Hey, listen, we are we've got to the end of our uh, question, Scott. I'm going to pitch it to you real quick. Uh, any last minute thoughts in just a second? By the way, uh, if you are brand new to the show, uh, this is Ed Talks Live. We go live every day, Monday through Friday, 10 o'clock Pacific, one o'clock Eastern, for the most positive place on the planet for insanely implementable ideas. Uh, tomorrow is the Ask Me Anything show. So you get on the show, come on and ask me any question that you want within reason, <laughs> I'm happy to answer it. Uh, and um, we'll have more amazing guests like the one that you're listening to right now. Um, Scott, take us home. What are your parting thoughts for today? Well, I think we need to leave with that practice, you know, because that's one of the things that we promised people at the beginning. And I think, you know, a problem statement for CEOs and the executives I work with is that their days are just too reactive. You know, they're consumed running from demand to demand, and there's a lot of unnecessary and undesirable noise going on. Most organizations are simply trying to do too much. Um, and like athletes, you know, leaders need time to kind of set down. They got to they spend energy, but they have to spend time renewing energy as well. And a lot of times we're so focused on productivity that we don't take any time to slow down. So one of the things that I would recommend when you think about training, you think about athletes and people who do train, they have a daily ritual. Writers, they have a daily ritual. And this is a ritual that I picked up from Josh Waitskin. For those of you who don't know who Josh is, he was in that movie In Search of Bobby Fischer. He was a chess prodigy. He's been number one in the world in multiple domains. And he has a practice called MIQs. And what MIQ stands for, the most important question. What is the main inquiry that's in your attention, the answer to which could Im most impact your business or life? And so what Josh talks about is the practice of ending your day with quality, which means before you go home, that will be your home now, but you know when you're back at the office or when you're ending your day at home, before you transition into your family life, to literally get clear on what is the most critical area you should be applying your thinking and writing that down, closing the book and simply letting it go. Go be fully present to your family, sleep on it. Then the second part of this two-step method is start your day with quality. And what that means is pre-input. You don't look at email, phones, notifications. You sit down and you tune in to your conscious and unconscious mind and you write down everything that comes to mind. I would highly recommend you try it. Uh, it's, it's a game changer uh, for the executives I put it in place with. You just record it at the end of the day. You wake first thing, you do it. I promise you something new will emerge. And if it becomes a habit, you're going to find that your perceptive skills deepen. Uh, you're going to have a lot more clarity in your life and in your business. You're going to surface new choices that will allow you to rise above the busyness. And you're going to get out of that reactive thinking pattern that's keeping you trapped in the past. It's huge, man. Thank you for that. Yeah, man. And, uh, go, uh, go, you were going to say something? No. Oh, uh, make sure that you go to Scott's website, Scott W. Zimmerman, with one N at the end, dot com, and uh, check out everything that Scott has written. Um, we just want to say thank you so much for the enlightened conversation that's happening in chat. Y'all just decided to explode. Uh, so I appreciate just seeing Robert and Gina uh, and Dennis, Aubrey, and all of you going back and forth. I think that's really great. Scott, I wanted to mention two people, uh, Paula. Uh, Keps, who said, I had the pleasure of working with Scott, helped to shape right. my leadership style without a doubt. So it's very cool, Paul, that you came and joined us on the show. Come join us again, if you would. Uh, and Tor says, great discussion. Thank you. I think those are two folks that came here uh, from you. David Zett says, boom, Scott is the man indeed. Uh, so Scott, thanks for joining us today. Uh, listen, today's show is an example of the, of the reason why you tune in to something like this. There's at least one step 
you can take today and take action on that will change your business, that will change your career, potentially change your life, and then the world. Listen, the world's a dark place. The world's a dark place right now, but that doesn't mean that your light can't shine. And don't forget that when it's darkest, it's easier to see the light. So when would now be a really great time to get your message, your story, or your experience out in the world? How about now? This is Ed Talks Live. I'll see you tomorrow. Have an awesome day.